Hello, I'm Robin Vincent and welcome to Surface Sessions. Today, we're having a look at the Surface Pro 6. It's Microsoft's latest Surface, hot off the production line and available in gorgeous black, which is what I've got here. Now, the purpose of this video is to establish whether the Surface Pro 6 can handle low latency, real time audio. Now, I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, well, it's a decent computer. Of course it can handle real time low latency audio, can't it? Well, yes and no. You see, the, the world of laptops and portable devices in particular is peppered with people who can't seem to get it to work because streaming low latency real time audio from a piece of recording software or from a virtual instrument is not a normal thing for a computer to do. Computers love browsing the internet, they love playing games, they love playing music and movies and all that kind of thing. Let you write letters and emails. None of them are really designed to handle multi channels of audio and software effects and instruments all being generated and put together and stuffed down a USB port and out to your speakers. None of them are designed to do that. And so actually that any of them do do that is in some ways a bit of a miracle. And so when a new piece of gear like this comes out, it's really important to test whether it's capable of doing what we want. It has nothing to do with the power of the CPU. You can have as much power as you like coming off the processor. What matters is whether it's able to produce a constant stream of audio without interruption, without glitching, without dropping out. And for lots and lots of devices and laptops and computers out there, it's a bit of a struggle. And that's the whole reason why Surface Pro Audio exists. It's the whole reason why I do this stuff is because until somebody does it and tells the world about it, then you don't actually know. And people are kind of stuck there going, well, I don't know whether I should get it because I'm not entirely sure whether it should work or not. Or people just jump straight in, get at home and then go, well, this isn't really working like it should. Why not? This is so much better than my old laptop. My old laptop could do it without any trouble at all. Whereas this new fancy one is struggling. What's that about? But as I say, it's nothing to do with the newness of your computer. It's nothing to do with the processing power. It's to do with lots of other bits of technology within the system and how well they behave and whether the processor can get its power down to that audio stream. I'm not going to be able to cover absolutely everything in this video at all. No, I want to do other videos on bits and pieces and virtual instruments and effects and performance testing and comparisons, all that good stuff. But what we need to establish first is can this handle real time low latency audio? Can it run a few doors successfully? Can it run a USB audio interface without glitching or dropouts or messing about? And then having a look at, at what the CPU is doing and if there are any tweaks that we can apply to the system to get it running better. That's the plan. Are you still with me? Good. Well, at the moment, all I've done is installed a few doors and check them out to see whether they play back or not. And I'll demonstrate that in just a moment. But I haven't tweaked or changed the system at all. This is how it arrived, except for one thing. And this is very, very important. Yesterday, a pair of firmware updates appeared just in the Windows update thingy, and they massively improved one particular element of the system that I was testing at the time. And that was the DPC latency. I was using a piece of software called Latency Monitor or Latency Mon to test the drivers within the system to see if any of them were hanging on to the processor too long. Because when other things in the system, like your Wi Fi, your networking, bits and bobs, when they interrupt the processor to do something, that's usually fine. But sometimes they hold on much longer than they need, usually caused by poorly written drivers or, you know, sunspots or something. And when they do that, it can cause a dropout in your audio stream because the processor needs to focus entirely on the audio that's going in and out of the system in order to maintain a perfect stream of audio. Something comes along and goes, oh yeah, I just want to check something on the internet. The processor can usually deal with it, but if it hangs on too long, then wham, you get that dropout. And this piece of software latency monitor can show that or demonstrate that or have a go at visualizing those sorts of issues. And it's a really helpful guide to showing whether your computer, your laptop, your tablet can run audio software successfully. So let's start with that. Now here somewhere on your screen should be 
a photo of the performance that I was getting yesterday. Do you see all of the, the redness, all the, the badness, the red writing and things that look quite alarming on it? Well, that is basically saying that there's stuff inside the surface which is going to cause dropouts. And that's bad news. However, after these firmware updates appeared, I then ran the test again. And this is what I'm going to show you now. There we are. Much better. Much, much better. It's all, you know, more or less in the greens. It is creeping up a little bit. I mean, that's kind of to be expected on a system that's not designed necessarily for music making. There's always going to be a bit of action going on. But previously, this was all up here. And this was all red writing saying, no, it's not going to work. It's not going to work. Whereas now, it's looking pretty sweet. Now, this doesn't necessarily mean anything of itself. All it is is an indication of what the system should be capable of. And this is telling us that the Surface Pro 6 with those two firmware updates should be capable of handling real-time, low latency audio. Awesome. So with that established, let's run some demo songs in various bits of software and see how it does. But before that, let me just tell you what the setup is. So this is the Surface Pro 6. It's the i5 8 gigabyte Surface Pro 6. It's a quad core apparently, which is awesome. And like all surfaces, it has the single USB port over here. It's not USB-C. Oh no. Now I know a lot of people are upset about that, but actually for me personally, I have no USB-C gear. So a USB-C port is completely pointless from my point of view. So actually I don't mind. Everything I have is regular USB. That may change in time, but for now, a regular USB port, that's all right. I don't mind that at all. And I have plugged into here an Arturia Audio Fuse, which is this fellow over here. This one, this one. Now, ignore this. This is the Surface Go that I'm also testing, which is awesome, of course. But I'm doing a lot of things at once at the moment, and so it's all a bit crowded on here. But the Audio Fuse, Arturia Audio Fuse, is an awesome USB audio interface. And that's what I'm using to test the system with. Now I could be using the onboard sound, but the onboard sound is, let's face it, a bit rubbish. But I'll do another video on that at some point because people do want to move these around in a mobile situation on the bus making music and it'll be good to test out how you can do that and how well that works or doesn't. I'll also be doing the same thing on the Surface Go. But let's not get confused. We're talking about the Surface Pro 6 here. So I have the audio fuse plugged in directly into the USB port in the side and then the audio fuse actually has a handy little USB hub on the back of itself. And so into there, I've plugged my iLock and my Cubase dongle. Very handy. So for the purposes of this test, I don't need to be using any kind of hub of anything at all. I'm just plugged directly in. It's powered. It will always be on power. Again, I'll do another video of it not being powered. But to get the best results on this initial round of testing, I heartily recommend leaving it plugged in. So, right, let's get on with some testing then. I'm going to be using three doors. I'm going to be using Cubase Pro, I'll be using Avid Pro Tools, and Ableton Live. Those are the three. I'm just going to be running some demo songs, check how the CPU behaves, see if there are any dropouts or any issues, and go from there. Right, let's start with Cubase. This is Cubase Pro 9.5, just running the demo project. Got the audio performance window open to see you know, a rough idea of what's going on. And let's see how well it performs. Let's just check the audio setup. So we have the Arturia ASIO driver selected, obviously, and it's currently set to a rather safe buffer size of 256 samples, which gives us an input and output latency of around 10 milliseconds. So I'm giving it, you know, every, every chance, every encouragement to run properly. Ooh, there is a lot of movement. Oh, there we go. There's a dropout. So something, something is going on because it was fine and then it started creeping up and then wham, there was a glitch. So what we'll do, we'll bring up the CPU performance meter. Now, unfortunately, what I usually use is the Intel XTU 
extreme tuning utility, which gives us a lot of detail on what the processor is doing, how the temperatures, the performance of RAM usage resources, and all that sort of thing. But it won't work. You try to install it and it says, no, this is not a supported platform. So all we can use really is this thing here. And that'll give us some kind of idea at least of the speed of the processor. Now, of course, this is a, a device designed for mobile computing. And so it's gonna have a processor which likes to step down whenever you're not doing something. But that's no good. That's no good for audio production because you are always doing something because you are always going to need the same amount of power in order to run all of the plugins and the, the bits and pieces that are going on. And any drop in processor speed is no good. It's not what we want. And that's probably what's happening. So let's set it running again and let's watch what happens with the CPU speed. Look at that, it's dropped down to 0.8 gigahertz at the moment. So it's interesting. I mean, the, the speed of the processor should be 1.6. That's its standard base rate. Although oddly it says its base rate here is 1.8. So at the moment it's lost a whole gigahertz worth of processing speed. It's dropped down to 0.8. And there we get a glitch. Because Cubase needs more than that. It needs more power. And this is now winding up in order to compensate for that, but it doesn't do it fast enough because it's designed to run with normal computing. It's not designed to run with real time low latency audio, which is what we want here. So it's not fast enough. It can't suddenly ramp up fast enough in order to achieve the processing on the plugins and bits and pieces that Cubase requires. So even though it's now dropped back down again, because it's, it's got a little bit less to do, when more stuff is required in Cubase again, it's going to give us another dropout. Although interestingly enough, on this occasion, it's now leapt up. It must have seen something coming and has decided to sort that out a bit, which is great, but can it maintain it? No, see, it's dropped back down. It's gone in half. It doesn't make any sense because it's not as if the power requirements from Cubase have necessarily changed that much. There we go again, it's, it's trying to cope. It's ramped itself up to 2.4 there for a moment, but it's, it's not doing it fast enough and we get our audio dropout. I mean, there's a huge buffer size in here in terms of, of ADSIO. 256 samples is a lot of space for audio processing, but it's still unable to cope with that. And so we get the dropout. So what does this mean? What does this mean, Robin? Tell us what this means. Well, it means, well, all it really means is that the Surface is behaving like any other mobile laptop type computer. It is doing exactly what it's designed to do. When more is required of it, it turns up the CPU. When less is required of it, it powers it down so that your battery life is longer and you're not using up valuable planetary resources. And that's all fine for normal use, but for music production, here's a whole load of crap. And that's a shame. However, what I should, first of all, say and make a huge fuss about is that generally speaking, it's performing brilliantly. There's no sort of clickiness. There's no in the background or ticks uh, or any of that kind of interference or grunginess or problem with the CPU. This looks to me to be purely down to the speed stepping. It works fine, playback great, playback perfect. It's all running along fine, and then the CPU decides to you know, go on holiday for a moment and you get a glitch. Now that's the sort of thing that we should be able to deal with when we tweak the system. And so at the moment, actually, I have a lot of hope for this because it's producing fantastic playback, without any bother at all, which tells me that there's no dodgy drivers or weirdness in there, which is gonna prevent it from doing a half decent job at being a, a live performance rig or a little studio, all those sorts of things. So at the moment, it's just behaving exactly like you'd expect any laptop to behave. And the point of tweaking, which we'll get to in a moment, is to force it 
to think and behave more like a desktop computer. Right, let's cross reference Pro Tools to see what happens there and also Ableton Live. Pro Tools then, the classic Kelly Earth and Stars demo song that we've been using for decades, now it feels. Now the first thing I want to point out is that there's none of the scaling issues that we had with the Surface Pro 2017, with the Surface Pro 4 and with the Surface Pro 3. All of them scaled weirdly when you loaded this song. It's like some of the plugins don't really like scaling and so it went tiny, tiny down here into a tiny little corner and everything was really, really weeny and it messed you all about. Now either Avid have done something when, to improve those plugins, but that just seems highly unlikely. Or Microsoft have sorted something out which makes the scaling perhaps less fierce or, oh no, who knows? Suffice to say is that it loads up properly and looks good. So that's a bonus. It is pretty exciting to see eight cores here knocking around in the system usage. That's really good because it is a quad core system with virtual cores as well. So you've got all eight knocking about. So let's see how this goes. Now at the moment, the system usage over here is pretty stable, looks pretty good. And over here, the speed has been knocking around two gigahertz. Sort of quite consistent, quite constant. It's gone up to 2.3, it's gone down under two a little bit, but that's about it. None of the swings that we got in Cubase. See, that's very interesting. It's nothing like the difficulty we had with Cubase. I mean, you never get to say this, so I'm going to enjoy saying this, that Pro Tools is behaving much better than Cubase on this system, because Pro Tools is the worst. It always behaves the worst in any given situation. But in this particular test, in this single run through, it's performing and behaving itself brilliantly, which is nice. I don't know what secret source it has in order to enable it to do that, but we shall see. I mean, it, it may be if we leave it running longer, then eventually we'll find a glitch or something going on. Or if we start loading up the processor more with more plugins, which is a test we'll do at another time, then perhaps we'll see a difference there. But at the moment, the speed of the processor has remained within, you know, a small area. It's only gone up and down a little bit, and that's enabled Pro Tools to give us good, stable playback you know, over the course of a number of minutes. Good, let's check out Ableton Live. Now this is the Ableton 10 Suite demo song and in here the CPU meter is just this little weenie thing over here that we have to keep an eye on but of course we can have this up as well to see what's going on. Currently the CPU is whoa wanged itself all the way up to about 2.6 2.7 which is interesting. So let's see how well this performs. See, this is really interesting. With Ableton Live, it's sort of held the processor up at around 2.6. It hasn't moved anywhere near as much as it did within Pro Tools, and certainly nothing like what happened in Cubase. So again, we're getting a very different situation. It's interesting, isn't it, how different doors behave differently. I mean, you'd assume that audio engines are essentially the same, or they all essentially do the same thing, or perform in the same way. when Actually, they don't. Although there's no real reason to assume that the CPU behavior has anything to do with the door. It may just have decided that it's gonna run fast for a bit. You know, who knows? Who knows what triggers the processor to do or act like it does? It's not load, 
because in Cubase there was you know a load and it kept moving about all over the place. In Pro Tools there was a load and it moved quite a lot. In Ableton Live there's a load and it's staying more or less the same. And the amount of stuff loaded is actually similar in all of those doors. So what does that mean? So this is all very interesting because we're in a situation where now doors are behaving differently, which is not good. I mean, we like consistency. We like things to be the same and repeatable. And when things aren't, when things are all a bit, all oh, this and this, all oh, this and this, it's more difficult to draw conclusions and to, and to therefore it's more difficult to act in the right way. Because the very fact that Ableton Live is running the processor at about 2.8 is awesome because that's a whole gigahertz more processing power than it should have at its base frequency. And if it's able to maintain that all the time, it just popped up to three, by the way, then that's got to be a great thing, isn't it? Okay, it's now down to 0.8. I wonder what would happen if I ran it now. Is it going to crackle? Let's... Let's have a quick go. Okay, it was straight up to 1.5, then 1.8. Then it sort of dropped down to about one, now it's up to two again. See this time through, it's now leaping about. It's gone up to 2.3 and down to 1.7. Now up to 2.1. <laughs> Now it's got above two gigahertz. It seems as though it wants to stay there and that's maintaining good playback, you know? Ah, oh, but there was a glitch. And again, and again. Okay, so inconsistency. Was that a word that I used? Hmm, there you go, you see? So although it was lovely that Ableton Live was maintaining a kind of a 2.8 gigahertz processor speed as it was playing through its demo song, when I stopped it and then the processor had nothing to do, so it kind of went away again, and then I started it up again, it was not able to cope. It tried, it went up and down, it tried different places and different things, but it wasn't able to maintain it. And so we had that step down again, glitch, trying to go up, glitch, trying to come down, glitch. That's the problem. Now it's quite possible that if I go back to Pro Tools and try that a few more times I will hit the same issues because while the processor can do speed stepping, while it's free to step itself up and down willy-nilly as it likes, then it will and we have no control over that. Therefore we have no control over the stability of the CPU. Therefore there's no knowing how many plugins it could possibly run. Because maybe you could run a hundred plugins when it's running at 2.8, but then when it drops down for no apparent reason, you can suddenly only run 50 plugins, or 20 plugins, or 10 plugins, or one plugin. That's the trouble with a speed stepping processor. You cannot put a figure on what you can do. And so when you're trying to build a project, there'll be some days when you can keep adding plugins and you're, hey, this is great, I'm mixing, I'm playing synths, it's all going brilliantly and then you come back to the same project the next day and you can't do any of it. This, my friends, is why we tweak. And I'm not talking about this sort of tweaking. I like this sort of tweaking. I'm talking about tweaking the OS, tweaking the operating system, tweaking the surface to see if we can force it to maintain a constant CPU speed so that we can have some kind of reference and some kind of idea for what the system can do. So let me talk you through the tweaking. It's the same tweaking that I do all the time. It's the same sort of tweaks I haven't really changed for decades. And I know some people out there argue over what works and what doesn't. I don't really care. I'm not interested in the argument. All I want to demonstrate to you is what I think you need to do to make it work properly. It's mostly to do with power settings, but there may be a few other bits and bobs in there that you'll find helpful. There might even be some tweaks that do absolutely nothing. I don't know. But <laughs> all I can do is show you, direct you to all the videos I've done on tweaking that have had hundreds of comments underneath of people going, yeah, that worked for me. Yeah, that worked for me. Yes, that's brilliant. So by all means, argue with me and show me proofs on why something I'm doing is of no use whatsoever. 
that's fine. And if it doesn't work for you, just ignore it. Just do the tweaks you want to tweak. Do the stuff you want to do. All I'm trying to do is get the Surface Pro 6 to behave in a predictable way. Yeah, that's the plan. That's what I'm going to do. Okay, first thing you need to do, hit the Windows button and type Control and bring up the old fashioned control panel. Going to go to small icons. In here somewhere is the most important thing, which is power options. Now you can get to that by another route, I suspect, but this is all I'm doing here. Now, ideally, what we want to do is add a high performance power plan. In a normal computer, on a normal desktop or whatever, you have that as an option down here. You can go to further options and go to high performance and then change a few settings. That is denied to us in the Surface because, you know, actually Microsoft don't want you messing with that. They want to demonstrate that the Surface is an awesome mobile device. And if you start messing around with the power settings, that's going to reduce the battery life and reduce its ability to be an awesome mobile device. So that's their reasoning and that's fine, but we're not your standard user, we're a power user. And so we want to be able to change this. To do that, we have to do a little bit of registry hacking. Now it's not scary, it's easy, let me show you. Press on that button again or on your keyboard and type reg edit. This is a registry editor. Again, it's not scary. Press F3 in order to find something. You might need to turn your little function button on down there and type CS enabled. CS enabled. Now, once again, I can't for life me remember what that stands for. Control set, something like that. Who knows? But that's the term that we're looking for within the registry. Now there's an address for it somewhere that maybe I'll put up on the screen. I'm not sure, but you can find it this way. Now we'll find it in different places. We're looking for the place where it exists in power profiles. So give it a minute and it will have a look. No, that's not the one. Hit F3 to keep on searching. No, that's not it. Keep on searching. Okay, this might be it. CS enabled, there we go. Now over here, what you can't quite see, it is under power, which is where we want it to be. So that's the one. So CS enabled, double click. It's currently set to one. What you want to do is set it to zero. Hit OK. Then you should reboot. Now, if we go back to the control panel, power options, it's still not there. Now, on another laptop, in another situation, perhaps with a slightly older version of Windows, you should now have the option come up here. But we don't. With the latest Windows 10 updates, that option again gets removed. And we have to find it under Create a Power Plan. Now, we have the option for high performance. That wasn't there before. If you were looking for this before you did the CS Enable tweak, it would not exist. You would not have these options. So that tweak is the most vital one. If you're going to do anything, you have to do that. Select high performance. So when it's plugged in, I'm going to say never. Now, all I'm interested in at the moment is how things are plugged in. I don't want to use it on battery for the moment. So I'll leave the battery settings as they are, because that might be helpful and hit create. Now we have our annoyingly named my custom plan one. We now go to change plan settings and it looks like it takes us back to the same place, but we have an additional option now, which is to change the advanced settings. Now, again, this is not something you can get to by any other route. There are things in here you need to change. Do you want the hard disk to turn off after a minute? No, we do not. So you need to put that to zero for plugged in and for battery probably. USB settings, open that one up. USB selective suspend setting, we want that to be disabled. And then most important, processor power management, minimum and maximum processor state. We need it to be 100% for minimum and maximum. Now, because we've enabled high performance mode, 100% is what is enabled by default. 
which is not usually there. Now, with a bit of luck, I mean, I haven't done this yet. Well, I'm, all, I'm doing all of this in real time. You are witnessing my tweaking of my Surface Pro 6. I haven't pre-tweaked it. This is the first time I'm doing it. So hopefully our experience with previous services has told us that when we do this, it stabilizes the processor. Hopefully it will do it again. Hit apply, hit OK. That is the most important tweak. Now I'm going to do a couple of other tweaks, which are the ones that I just always do that generally help the performance of the system. Let's go to system. We go to advanced system settings. Performance settings. Now you can take off all the animations and fades if you like, and that makes the system feel that little bit quicker, but you don't have to. Under advanced at the top here, adjust best performance of programs or background services. I've seen clicking this button here to background services improve the performance of so many systems that I really can't avoid doing it. Virtual memory is another one. So I take off automatic, I go for custom size, I put in four gigs. That seems to help. Under the new settings, go to all settings, go to privacy, go down to somewhere down here, background apps, let apps run in the background. Turn that off. Then finally, startup programs. Go to your task manager. If it looks like this, then click on more details. Go to startup. See all this stuff here? It doesn't need to be running. Now I do have something here for the AudioFuse control center. And I do want that to be running all the time because I might want to access it while I'm using the software. So I'm gonna leave that one enabled. So after another reboot, we will see what occurs. Let's check out that processor speed. Does it go up, does it go down, does it stay fixed? And if so, at what level does that occur? So let me bring you in again and let's see whether this was a complete waste of time or whether everything now is glorious. Well, just loading everything up. This is still wanging all over the place, but let's see what happens within the project itself. What's interesting is that it appears to be staying around 1.6. I mean, for the most part. Again, it's just climbed up to above two. Now it's come back to 1.6 again. Is that more stable behavior than we had before? We've we'll certainly not run into any dropouts as yet, but you know, we have to give these things time. Certainly over here on the VST performance meter within Cubase itself, this is a lot more stable. It's not climbing up and down like it was before we tweaked the system. Yeah, interesting. As I say, I've not pre-done this, so I'm discovering it as we're doing it right here, right now. And that is interesting. It is staying around 1.6, which is supposed to be the base frequency, and it's performing well and behaving itself, not giving us these large movements in CPU speed, although there was some movement, and that's enabled it to give good solid playback. And if you have a set speed like 1.6, you have something to work on. So if it's not dropping down and removing your ability to run plugins, which is where you run into the trouble, you wanna have something which is set so that you can work up to that level. If there's a little bit of turbo allowed after that, then, then so be it. But provided that we have a base at which it stays, that is what we're after. Pro Tools then.
Now immediately you can see that my, my theory with Cubase is being undermined by what Pro Tools is doing. Pro Tools is running at around 2.1, 2 gigahertz, oh look, 2.3. It's still moving things about a bit like it was before. So it's a little bit difficult this time to know whether the tweaking we did had any effect at all. But in both instances, before and after, the playback was stable and fine. So Pro Tools then, that's really helpful and inconclusive. Great. Ableton Live. It's interesting because Ableton Live seems to be favouring 1.6 again. Although it has gone up and down a bit, it was a lot more lively before we tweaked. Yeah, now it's gone up to 2.4. No, it's happily sitting up there at sort of 2.3 gigahertz. Hmm. Interesting. Stable though, good though, no glitching this time around. So what are we to make of all this this time around then? Wow, I don't know. Cubase definitely benefited from the tweaks as a whole, and the system seems to be favoring the 1.6 gigahertz as opposed to always moving somewhere else, but then not always. It depends on what it's doing. So at this stage, we seem to have cured the drop down to below 1.6, so it's not turning itself off and speed stepping all the way down to the bottom, you know, to under one gigahertz, which is what was causing the problems in Cubase. It's now stabilized at 1.6 and still turboing up and down a little bit. At least that seems to be what I can deduce from this. Now there's one more thing that we can try, which I've used on other systems, partly for uh, keeping heat under control, but also partly for keeping turbo under control. And that's the magic 99%. What do I mean? Well, do you remember the setting in the power settings where we set the max and the minimum usage of the CPU to 100%? Now I found on other surfaces that if, when you set it to 100%, it still uses speed stepping and turbo mode. But when you set it to 99, it sort of turns off turbo mode and sits the processor at a set speed. At least I think it does. Anyway, let's give that a try. So back into power options, change plan settings, advanced power settings. Down here, processor power management, minimum and maximum. We are going to set those to 99%. Now that seems like nuts. Let's do it. So I'm going to restart as well, just to make sure that that takes, and then we'll see what happens. And we can already see, just as Cubase is loading up, that CPU speed appears to be fixed. That's interesting. Now before we changed it to 99%, the processor speed was knocking around about 1.6. And it seems to be doing something very, very similar. Now that part of the track is when uh, the CPU utilization goes up a bit because there's more plugins and tracks running. And you can see how this has gone up here but there's been no real change to the processor speed. Okay, so that's Cubase being all stable and normal at about 1.6. Right, back to Pro Tools. 
<laughs> See, look at that. It was immediately up at 2.3, completely ignoring the tweaking that I'd done. So there's Pro Tools being annoyingly consistent and stable and unexpectedly wonderful in this situation with the processor still stepping up, but never dropping below 1.6. Hmm, Ableton Live then. Now this is very interesting. This is now rock solid at 1.69, has been all the way through, hasn't moved up or down, hasn't gone anywhere. Oh look, just went to 1.64. See, it likes to fool with me. But it's the most rock solid anything has been. Before we did any of these tweaks, this was up to 2.4, 2.8, three gigahertz at some times, whereas now it appears to be rock solid. Well, interesting isn't it what a strange and confusing situation no no not really it's okay we are starting to get to grips i think with what the surface pro 6 is doing and this is going to be enormously helpful for us as we move forward into other testing and other checking and other bits and pieces and start making music on the thing from what i can see what i can draw from what we've seen here together is that before the tweaking, we had some problems with the processor going up and down, dropping to under one gigahertz, flying about all over the place, trying to save power. And that's always a bad thing on a system you're trying to make music on. You want a stable CPU as much as possible. That's not always possible. Not all CPUs are designed to run at a single speed. Some are designed to go all over the place just like this, but you just need to do something to keep it under control. And so the tweaking that we did the setting of the power profile and other bits and pieces have brought the processor under control. It's not moving about anywhere near as much as it did. And now we could start using the machine for music production and have some idea of how far we can go, of what sort of headroom there is for using plugins and virtual instruments and how that's going to remain constant, which is the most important thing. The further tweak I added with the 99%, the magic, 99%, that seems to have created the most stable environment. It's still not completely there because Pro Tools seems to be doing its own thing <laughs> entirely, but it's doing it in a very stable way. And you know, stability is good. We like that. And so although I'm slightly perplexed by how it keeps managing to step up the processor, I'm not worried because it isn't producing any problems. Because ultimately the question is, does it work? Well, it's working. Well, they leave it alone. You know, that's, that's the idea really. But now in Ableton Live and in Cubase, the processor stays more or less steady. I mean, it was completely at 1.69 within Ableton Live, which is interesting. In Cubase, it moved about a 0.1 of a gigahertz up and down a little bit, but both very, very stable, great playback, no glitching, no dropouts, no clicks or pops anywhere as far as I could tell. And that of course, it's completely awesome. So the really good news that I am very confident to put across at the moment is that provided you have those firmware updates and provided that you've followed my tweet guide for the Surface Pro 6, then it appears to be completely capable of running door software and running a USB audio interface. Now, I should say that I've been talking to a few other people who are running Surface Pro 6s who have run into the odd problem and that appears to be down to their USB audio interface. So if you have a Surface Pro 6 and you've gone through all of the tweaks and all of the settings I've suggested and you're still having kind of a constant glitching problem regardless of how intense your project is, then consider trying another audio interface. I mean, you know, order one off Amazon, try it out and send it back if it doesn't do anything different. Any way you can to try another USB audio interface to see whether that's causing the problem because I have seen that 
cause problems at times. But barring that, I think you can confidently set off with a Surface Pro 6 knowing that within the limitations of the system and form factor itself, it is gonna be able to help you produce music. Now, moving forward, which is what inevitably we need to do from this point, I will be doing a lot more testing. I wanna be doing performance testing. I wanna compare it to the Go, compare it to the last generation of Surface to see how many more plugins we can run, how much more polyphony can we do, how many more virtual instruments can we play at once on this machine. And in doing that sort of thing, I'm gonna be monitoring the CPU speed, how that works, whether the 99% thing is a good thing or a bad thing in this situation, whether we can discover other tweaks to give us more power and more processing and more plugins and more stuff to do. And ultimately, I will keep testing stuff and keep using different bits of software so that I can give you the best chance of making the right decision. Because you ultimately have to make the decision whether you want to use this machine or not. All I can do is give you examples of what it can and can't do to try to present to you and demonstrate how far you can go with it. And then you, you have to extrapolate from that whether that's good for your situation. It's no good you saying to me, how many of this plugin can it run? Because I don't know unless I've run that particular plugin. You know, it all comes down to what you are running and only you can really replicate that situation. So I can just give you examples and you have to decide whether how that works and how that compares to what you are actually doing. I'm going to try to cover a lot of virtual instruments and effects and bits and pieces the same as I am on the Surface Go. So you can have a good idea of which one is going to work best for you. But on the whole, you know, I'm really pleased with where we got to. We've got to a position of a relatively stable CPU with good playback, with no issues that I've seen so far, using a USB audio interface, all plugged in, all tweaked, and good to go. Even untweaked, it didn't do half bad. So there you are, I hope that was helpful. That's the Surface Pro 6. It's doing all right, let's move forward. If you found this helpful, then then please, you know, share it, subscribe, tell me how great it is, argue with me in the comments about stuff. I don't mind. I've always got an opinion. I've always got a sarcastic air and I'm always happy to talk nonsense at any time. Or if you're feeling particularly daring, then head on over to my Patreon page where you can send me a couple of dollars and that will really help me in producing more videos and getting more gear together for review and all that sort of stuff. It's really extraordinarily helpful. So that I'll do, look out for more modular videos coming very soon. And in the meantime, go and make some tunes.